I'm Ramin. And I'm Dan. And we are... Two Blokes and, and a, a Mic. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> it's getting better. <laughs> and we are here once again to uh, chat about stuff that's going on in the world today. The things are changing rapidly. Yep. Um, and hiring qualified personnel is becoming a real issue across the board. Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, not only hiring them, but then retaining them once you've hired them, right? Is it? And, and the whether they're remote or they're local, how do you check on their work if they're remote? Right. And so on and so on. Right, yeah. Some of that, some of the traditional notions of, I had this conversation with somebody the other day, that some of the traditional notions of how an employee should behave and where they should show up for work, etc. Right. Really go back to the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. Hmm. If you think about it, you yeah. know, the, the manager was up on a balcony watching the people on the floor and right. while they busily went about their jobs, right? That's right. That's you, right. You need to show up at the office, damn it. You know, with a whip. With a whip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're not going to pay you anything and you have to work hard. Right. Um, and I think the pandemic completely upended that whole notion right right there was this there was this constant argument about you know if you if if our employees work from home we'll never get anything done and the pandemic proved that wrong 100 percent. yes right the companies that were looking for efficiencies got them because they didn't have people having to commute right people would get up in the morning and by 8 39 o'clock they were at their desks and they continued to work and they actually got more work done because they were sitting at a desk at home, right? And it's it's interesting. It's an interesting thing. And I've actually had chats with people recently who were like, "No, no, we want we want to try and get our employees to come back in the office because the argument now is we can't develop a corporate culture if people aren't in the same room." But you know, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but you opened Pandora's box. Yeah, um, exactly. When you when you wanted those people to continue working and you wanted your company to continue to survive. Yes. They had to work remotely. Yes. And they had to do that for a long time. And people got used to that. It wasn't just a little blip. It was, hey, this is the new normal. Yes. Now you're trying to pull them back into that environment. Yes. And it's tough. And so I think that is partly, you know, uh, the reason for the great resignation. But I... We know clients and and um, other people that are trying to hire, mm. and one of the requirements of the hire is that they can work remotely. And that's becoming a, an increasing requirement. Yeah, and if that's if that's not an option, sorry, not interested. sorry, they won't they won't even talk they won't even talk to you about yeah. it. Yeah, they they won't. And uh, it's it's interesting. Some people are, and this is the other thing that people are are. are um, employers are having trouble with is they're finding people hiring them and then they don't show up for the first day of work I've seen that yes yeah so there there are the dynamics of the employee employer interaction are in flux they're changing dramatically right. um, and I think everybody wants employers just want it to freaking work without having to put too much effort into it and employees are wanting the well generationally it, our generation and older are you're lucky to have a job just freaking do the job right go to work every day that's what we did that's right. that's that was our work ethic the newer generation wants to do a job go get a job where they can make an impact right the problem is that they can't really define for you most of them what making an impact actually means <laughs> um, so they they get a job because they can't make an impact or it doesn't seem immediately obvious that they can make an impact, they quit and go find another job. Mm. And so you're having, this is what's feeding that whole great resignation thing, is, is that it, we have almost an entire generation of people who are looking for something, but it's not clearly defined. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, it's difficult and it's, hard to have that you know well you know it, and it's not about the hourly wage i mean even if you 
and the, the conversation yeah. starts with, well, maybe you need to pay a living wage, but okay, there are the, if you're not flipping burgers at McDonald's, but even that's like $17 an hour. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're, if you're a professional paying a living wage is kind of a, a foregone conclusion, but yet they, there seems to be a lack of stickiness to employees. And I think because many employers are of a traditional bent, mm. they don't know how to deal with that. Right. Right. right? It's, it's, I think, like you said, um, hourly or the actual wage is a component, but it's not the component. No, it's and not. it's very much about uh, culture in that company uh, and how people will feel uh, vested or sidelined, and um, that whole environment. It's you know, obviously, you need the money, but um, you also want to work in a place that you feel valued that you feel as though you're contributing, that there is progress and you know, all the other things that mm-hmm. go along with a career, not just a job. Right. And Correct. I can't blame people for wanting that. Um, it's Everyone wants that. Everyone wants to be valued. And but I think those things mean different things to different people. And if you, as an, as a, as an employee seeking work, can't define for yourself. Oh, yes, yeah. 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 What that means, right, right? Right. What does it mean for me to be fulfilled? What does it mean for me to <coughs> to do work that you know f- uh, fills my soul? Uh, right. Whatever. If you can't define that, mm-hmm. there isn't an employer in the world that's going to be able to meet your needs because you don't even know what your needs are. Yeah. So I think the first thing that everybody needs to do, regardless of whether you're a millennial or whether you're you know Gen X or Gen, a baby boomer. You need to define for yourself as a human being what it means to be fulfilled. Mm-hmm. What does that mean, right? And at a very deep level, not just money, right? Right. Uh, and so that's going to require a, le- a lot of introspection on the parts of a lot of people. Yep. Right. You have to be able to stand up and tell the world what it means for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you can't do that, there, there's nobody that can help you. Uh, you're, you're always going to be disappointed with whatever job you get. Even if they're paying you six and seven figures, you're still going to be right. right, disappointed because it's not what your soul wants. It's not what your heart wants. Yeah. Right? I think uh, for a lot of it, I mean, the challenge employers are facing is that you know the market has changed in terms of the environment for employees. Yes. And... People are not willing to go back. And because of that, people are having to pay more money to get those people to do those jobs that they want them done. And that kind of has a um, you know snowball effect that then people become more expensive. They're not willing to, right. to do certain things. Well, um, I think, it, I think it's, it's, it's important that everybody acknowledge the fact that there is no magic pool of money Right. From which you can always get paid higher wages. Higher wages means yeah. I have to, as an employer, pass those higher wages, the cost of that on to my consumers. Right. Right. By but, definition. But I think, you know, as an employer, you, you know, as we, as we touched on before, it's not just about the money. It's also about the environment. So if yes. you can change that job, if you can change that role to be more flexible, mm-hmm. to allow those people to, to uh, either work from home um, I mean, just in the Bay Area, uh, you and I both, yeah. and I think just about every other company here, is, str- is struggling to find people. Um, and so that necessarily means that, I mean, for, for our perspective, is that we are looking further and further afield. If we can't find anybody here, then we're going to have to have that person work remotely. Uh, By definition, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so then you've got other things to consider. You've got time zones to, to consider. You've got language barriers to consider. You've got um, productivity and work ethics to consider. Then if you, you know, traditionally, if you had somebody in the office, you could manage and monitor and maintain that mm-hmm. space and their productivity and everything else. So now it brings in a whole different mm-hmm. way of working and managing and so it's it's like an evolution, not not only just for the uh, employees, but also for the companies to yes. 
to change management to, needs to think differently yes it's just that's just the way it is it's the world is no longer what it was no and in a way that's good in, yeah, in a way that's good uh, it makes it for us as employers it makes life a little bit more difficult uh, because finding good people who it, it, so there's a difference between I want a job because I have bills to pay right versus I want a job because I, I want a job that lets me be fulfilled and allows me to be happy with what I do right? so I, I would <coughs> we classify that as a career. Yeah. So uh, do you want a job or do you want a career? Correct. And it's, it, you can't, I mean, it, it, you can't take a job that's, you know, whether it's like I, you know, when I first got started, my job was to mop the floors at the McDonald's I worked at. That's not a career. <laughs> <laughs> and so the expectations that I would somehow go from mopping the floors to, you know, upper management. Right. That that path wasn't there, right? Mm-hmm. That was not realistic. The question is, what is? Two things have to happen. There has to be there, the, jobs have always been an exchange of exchange of something, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in the end, in in the past, it has been an exchange of money for that thing you call talent and capabilities, and you know. But I think the 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 exchange needs to change now. There needs to be value had by both parties now, mm-hmm. right? The the employee used to be the expendable commodity. Right. Right. And, you know, they're, they're, I mean, literally management, the thought pattern was there were a dime a dozen. And what has happened since the lockdown is that they've been, it's been proven that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a good evolution. Yeah, it Uh, is a good, I think, I think it is a good evolution. It, it puts, it put it forces us to put ourselves on a more equal footing with our employees. Well, it, there's also the value. Uh, yeah, like correct. If you're looking at a, an employee as a commodity, that's you know, uh, that's not a good thing. No, uh, it, and, and it's not a. I mean, it it worked because that's how our society was structured before. But you, you but could, the structure is changing. Yeah, but I mean, like going back to uh, the olden days, there was other ways of commoditizing human beings as well. That yes, which was like there is a there is a right. vague connotation there, but it's it's, it's not. Uh, you know, it, now with the empowering of the employees, with the the recognition that they are not just a, a tool but they can actually be part of a community or part of the company itself that they would identify themselves as being part of that company regardless yes. of whether they hold stock or anything else right but, right you know it's it's the the environment the whole thing the whole the whole ball the, of you, wax. you feel like you're you're partnered with your employer yes. yeah. rather than I, I, subservient to it I mean, that's, yeah. the, that's the difference the only reason I'm here is for paycheck we've had that before we've had that conversation before right so, and it's and if you're having that conversation with your employees you may want to rethink how you, what your relationships are with your employees well, that's not a good fit you that's know, not a yeah it's not yeah. a good fit you've either got the wrong person or the way you handle your employees needs to be modified right right because if all they see you as as a source for a paycheck mm-hmm that's not healthy. Yeah. Because then they'll just, when, when when it becomes too onerous, they'll just go somewhere else and get a paycheck. Yep. And leave you wanting. And I doubt very much they'll be the most productive employee as well. Typically so. not. If they're there just for a paycheck, they're not the most, no, most productive. Because they don't, they haven't got buy-in. Right, exactly. Right? They don't, they don't care if your organization succeeds or not as long as a check comes in. Yep. Right? Which is somewhat of a self-defeating notion, but it... I see the origin of it, right? So the, 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 the big question is, how do you get from there to here? And I, I think, honestly, uh, it's education uh, of management, education yes. of the owners, education of the employees. And really, regular meetings, um, having an open dialogue, being able to you know, essentially keep your door open so that employees are yeah. welcome to, Correct. to, to vent to discuss, to challenge ideas that, that they right. think are wrong. And and that is all, I think, a very healthy thing. But at the same time, there still has to be a clear definition of 
Correct. Who's the employer and who's the employee? Well, and, and that's and that's a function of responsibility as well. As, as I've said to some of my employees in the past, if everything goes well, it's my fault. If everything goes horribly wrong, it's my fault. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, no matter what happens, it's my fault. Right. Right? So that level of responsibility I cannot put on an employee. Therefore, there needs to be some, some separation there by mm-hmm. definition. But the question is... And I think this is this is where the notion of one, our, our, one of our previous uh, episodes about whatever happened to customer service. Our job as employers is to take care of our main customers, mm-hmm. which is our employees, mm-hmm. and then it's their job to take care of our final customers. Right, right. And I think that's called you know you have to turn the org chart upside down. Many people, I think have fed their egos with, uh, you know, I'm at the top of the org chart, or I have a title. Uh, The bottom line is that you have to be, you cannot live in an ivory tower anymore. Uh, You have to be, you have to be down in the trenches. You have to be involved. You you need to know everybody's first name. Um, You need to show up and you need to make sure that your people have everything they need to get their jobs done. Doesn't matter what that is, right? Um, if your people are struggling for something, you need to be involved in solving that problem. So it's a little bit of a different approach. Um, many people have made sort of the, you know, people said people have said, oh, we're, we're at this company, we're family. Mm. I've run into, in all my years of work in two companies like that. Mm. Many people have said it, but only two have actually achieved it. Right. Right. What that says is it's all lip service. Mm. Right. As management, if you're going, you need to create that environment where your people feel safe coming to you with stuff. You can talk the talk, but you, you also got to walk. You got to walk the walk. If you right. if you can't walk the walk or not willing to walk the walk, you need to shut the hell up right. because you're not helping anyone. We'll make some changes. Yeah, is well, you you can you at this point in 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 our history, you can either walk the walk and make the changes necessary. Or you will be left wanting. Mm. You will be left unable to take care of your customers because your employees will disappear. Mm. They are not. They are not. You know, they're not indentured servants. Yep. Right. They don't need to work for you. Right. Right. So what are you doing to make it attractive? Right. What are you doing to help help them have? Are you helping them with with a living wage so that they can pay their bills? Are you helping them make sure that you know if they're doing commute, commuting for you on you know to your customer sites? Are you helping them with their with their bridge tolls? It, you know, it's the little things in life, right, 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 that make the difference, mm-hmm. right. It's it's the salary is. I mean, as long as the salary is reasonable, yeah, right. That's not the problem, right. It's a question of what are you asking your and this is where, sorry, but th- this is one of my big bugaboos. This is where teachers mm-hmm. are, frankly, being abused and have absolutely. Been, you know, it's. In no other organization, in no other industry, <clears throat> do you t- do you tell your employees, "Here's your salary." By the way, all of your materials that you need to do to take care of that customer has to come out of your pocket personally. Right. right. What? Yeah. It, it, <clears throat> any, that would be okay if you paid me like twice the amount. Twice the amount. Yeah. <laughs> or I was able to expense it, but that's not it. Right. And teachers are being forced, and and people joke about it. It's not a joke. <clears throat> yeah. You know. And, and and okay, so if you're a, if you're a teacher that's been doing it for thirty years, you've got master's degrees, that kind of stuff, and you're making almost a six figure salary, maybe that's okay ish. It's really not. Mm. But if you're a junior teacher just getting tar- started, mm. right, and you're making barely making thirty thousand dollars a year, and you got to spend ten grand a year on materials and supplies to take teacher students, right. what? So this is this is that thing is is and every school district says oh we don't have the budget nonsense right nonsense they spend money on things like layers of bureaucracy in the district offices it's priorities it's priorities your the teachers are not the priority you know uh, in our town just as an example there are and just uh, I don't know this is just an example of, of priorities but um, there are certain roads that have potholes everywhere and nothing's done correct and then there are other um, roads that are fine 
and yet we'll get a complete, uh, complete re resurface and, and everything else. And okay, I understand that maybe that that uh, that road that got the resurface was slightly higher traffic uh, or is more visible or whatever it is, but you need to look, take a look at what actually needs to be fixed. Correct. Rather than um, every, every, perhaps give, you know, paying lip service. To well, it's, it's a function <laughs> of, and we all know this is true, everybody pretends it's not, but it is. If you live in a neighborhood, if you live in a low-income neighborhood, nobody's going to fix your potholes. Yeah. Right? I, I'm sorry, but that's <clears throat> that attitude is what pervades everything we do in our society. Yeah. Yeah. Right? If you if you have the temerity to not be a wealthy individual, right, right, you you get nothing. Yeah, right. And I'm not saying we need to have you know we need to everybody needs to be equal because that's that's not real. But at the same time, what does what does my neighborhood and the and the relative income in that neighborhood have to do with fixing a pothole on a road, right? right? Either you have the budget to fix the roads in your in your area, or you don't. But if you're putting all the budget into fixing the roads and that don't need fixing in the wealthy areas, then you know, right. sorry, but that that speaks to a level of underlying corruption. Yeah, and right, and a lack of caring. Period. End of story. Right. <laughs> my my kind of, my um, I guess. Um, point is that there needs to be better prioritization there needs to be you know when you have um a number of different priorities really take a look at what is most important and i know there's a lot of uh retired folks that don't care about education because they don't their kids have now gone through yep, education exactly. and, and they're done or people that don't have kids uh that are like well that, that doesn't affect me but you know, we are in this together, and well, yeah. when you when you reach a certain age, um, you're going to be reliant on other people to take to care do of things you, for you. To do things for you. <laughs> Those people need education, and you know, if we if we don't continuously really prioritize education, yeah. uh, the society as a whole in the future is going to be doomed. Uh, and that's just one example. Right. So no, I agree. We, we spun off on a tangent here, yes. but <laughs> that's okay. But, but but the reality is, I think it's it, it, it overall speaks to how we need to change, and this goes back to employers and employees. Yeah, flexibility, flexibility, and the thing that has uh, I had a, I had a CEO of a small startup come to me one day, and he goes, "Well, how do you, you know, how do you take care of your customers so well? What you know, what what do you do to what do you do to make sure your people are you know are always uh, out." aware of who your customers are and what you, what they need, et cetera. And I'm like, you got to give a damn, mm. right? It has to matter. Right. Right. And he goes, well, what happens when you end up with hundreds of customers? I'm like, you have to work harder. <laughs> There's no magic bullet here. Right? right. It, you either, you either care or you do not. Those are the only two possible choices. <laughs> that, that's right. But when you, I think to his point, when you care and you have too much work, there's only so much you can do, right? Now that that also speaks to the careful which client you take, because is, yeah. your your client your relationship with your client has to be, you know, in in a good. It has to be a relationship. Exactly, like your employees. Correct. Uh, and it, yeah, everything along the way <laughs> has to be a relationship, not just a, like a client vendor thing, because. Right. At the end of the day, if that is your relationship and you don't know your clients and you don't know your employees, then it's easy for that bond to be broken. Because there uh, is no bond, really. I mean, it's yeah, a, no it, good. It's, no. Yeah, it's very it's a, it's a superfluous bond and it, it'll it'll rapidly disappear. There is it, you have to work hard at developing depth in your relationships. Yeah, whether it's with your spouse, children, employees, clients, pets. Pets, <laughs> yeah, especially pets. Uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, you you you've got to care, right. right? It has to. The other person has to matter, and that's where our our society, our society has been historically stratified for the past five thousand years, right? And it's always been the well, I'm a, I'm of a certain stratus, and therefore I don't have to care about people of a lower stratus. And the reality is, look, you do. 
You do. If you want things done well, if you want to be successful, right? You and need, if you, you want need, to maintain that success. And you want to maintain that so, success, you yeah. got to care. you I, gotta, you got to give a damn. I, I can totally see, um, you know, that um, successful uh, person or, or organization or whatever that can run quickly. But uh, if you want to run, uh, if you want to sprint, that's fine. You can probably get success. But if you want a marathon, if you want that to be a long, long-term thing, right. you really do need to to pay attention to the relationships of your clients and right. your and your staff. Um, I I know you that you know that there's a lot of great people on YouTube, but there's a, you're familiar with Simon Sinek, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you guys haven't checked out his stuff, you need to go check out Simon Sinek. There's a thing. There's one of his videos. He says, as an employer, and this is also true as an individual in my estimation, you need to know what game you're playing. Mm. Are you in a short-term game where, you know, it's like, what are we doing this quarter? What's, you know, are we, have we met our goals this quarter? Or are you in an infinite game mm. where it's always constant improvement, constant caring, constant, you know, where you will eventually hit great heights. Um, and in one of his videos, he says that he was, he was at Microsoft one day, and this was back when they came out with their own MP3 player. They, it was called the Zune. Remember that? I remember that. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember <laughs> that. <laughs> and it was it was just beautiful, etc. And he then shortly thereafter went, and this was also when the early iPods had come out at Apple. And he went back to Apple, and he was talking to the product product uh, manager at Apple, and he says, "Oh, I was just at Microsoft, and you know these." These guys have a, the, the product is amazing. It has all these features, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's you know, and it's so much better than what you guys have. And the the reply from the Apple guy was, "I'm sure you're right." End of conversation. Because Apple was not in the "What's my competition doing?" game. Mm. Apple was in the "How can we help people? How can we improve people's lives?" Mm. It's a whole different game, and it is a much longer term game. Right. Right. And so the, that's the question is like, what, if you're worried about what's happening in the next quarter, which has been historically our game here in the world, you're always going to be chasing your tail. You're, it's, you know, as, as, you know, one of the things you have to do when you first get your pilot's license is they, they, they teach you to fly straight and level and you have to keep it at a particular altitude. And what people who are not, experience do is they they watch the altimeter go up and down and they try and correct for it right which is what basically what you know chasing your 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 tail during every quarter is right it's called chasing the needles mm. and whereas an experienced pilot will look out at the horizon and say that's where i'm going and the altitude thing works itself out because you are not chasing the needles mm -hmm. right so if you're spending your time chasing the, chasing the financial needles the societal needles the whatever needles they are you will forever be chasing them. Right. It's a complete and utter waste of time. You need to be playing the infinite game. Mm. I think. Um, I think. I think that was it, right? Yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah. On that note. On that note, uh, this has been another episode of Two Blokes and a, and a Mic, and we've uh, wasted a good what, half hour of your time or so. So thank you for joining us once again. Uh, please comment. Let us know what you think of all this. Uh, this is, I don't foresee this going away anytime soon. This is only going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. I mean, yeah. basically the takeaway is be flexible. Be flexible. Be Listen flexible. People. Take care of your people. Take care of your employees. Take care of your, your, the people in your household. Yeah. Take care of, take care of everybody you run into and you will find that that will loop back in positive ways to you. And on that note, have a wonderful day. Take care guys. Cheers.